so the Reformation. This is be going to cover both chapters 31 and 32 kind of at a glance. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. So starting off with the Catholic Church, which the Reformation was a spiritual religious movement that took place in Europe. So before the Re Reformation, the Catholic Church held most of the power in Rome and in Europe. Um, right before the Reformation, however, a lot of that power began to loosen, especially with the Renaissance and some of the ideas that came out of that of things like humanism or the belief in the self-conscious and one's own monitoring one's own actions for the betterment of the people. Um, so there was some splits that came about from this, um, but before that happened, um, you had people that started to outwardly question the, what the church was doing. Uh, one of the first to do this was a man by the name of John Wycliffe, who was a writer. And essentially what John Wycliffe said was that the church was corrupt and that many of the ways that the church operated was corrupt. So, for example, they sold these things called indulgences. And so what indulgences were is that you would pay the church money and your violations of church laws would be forgiven and you'd be admitted into heaven. So essentially they were selling religion for money and profit. And Wycliffe saw it and thought that it shouldn't be so, that, um, that religion shouldn't be about profit, it should be about God. Um, another man that came about was a man by the name of Jan Hus, who essentially was saying that the way that the church had its structure was off because the way the church, the Catholic church or the Christian church at the time, because Catholics were Christian, um, in other words, that they believed in Jesus as Christ or the Messiah, the one who was sent from God, the son of God, to save the world from its sin or its evil. And the way the Catholic Church was set up was it was set up as the Pope and the people under the Pope were the ones, the only ones, to interpret the Bible or the religious scripture. And then they would then pass laws that the people were to follow and basically tell people how to be religious, how to live their daily lives, stuff like that. So essentially all the power within the church resided within the leaders of the church. Well, Jan Hus believed that that was incorrect and that the scripture, the Holy scripture should actually be, able to be read by the individual and that the power should be in the Bible, which was the Holy Scripture of Christians at the time. Um, then came along a girl by the name of Catherine of Siena. So she was what was called a mystic, not because she was into the mystic arts or anything like that, but more so because Mystic was a term used to describe people who were really religious, who were believed to have had close experiences with God. Um, and so Catherine of Siena had made claims of like seeing visions and stuff of Jesus, of having close encounters with God. And so she was really religious and she was eventually named a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. However... it showed that people could have an experience with God outside of the, what the church offered. So there is a whole bunch of 
inner conflict going on at this time. There was even times where the actual center of the church was moved out of Rome and then moved back to Rome. And then there was two popes at different times. It was The church was really going through a lot of <clears throat> challenge and change. Um, as compared to before, <clears throat> when the Christian church was all unified as one under the Roman Catholic church. So the first official split came when a man by the name of Martin Luther, who was a priest of the Roman Catholic church, began to take on some of these earlier outcries about the corruption within the church in fact, he even went as far as to writing out a thing called, that he called the 95 Thesis, which he nailed to the door of a Catholic church that basically outlined 95 different things that he felt were corrupt about the Catholic church. And so after doing this, the Catholic church saw those and was basically furious with it. And so they excommunicated him. They kicked him out the church. So what does Martin Luther do? He goes and starts his own church and tries to get lords and princes and stuff to back him on it. And so that doesn't go over well with some of the local the peasants and stuff. So even at one point there's an uprising and, and Luther backs the nobility versus the people. And so you see some tension there. Um, later comes a man by the name of John Calvin, who also agrees with Luther that there's a lot of corruption within the church and things need to be changed. And so, but he also has some disagreements with how things should be changed. And so he branches off another section and calls which is called later called Calvinism. And then the third major break, which there's a lot of other breaks that happen within the church, the Christian church. Uh, but the next big one that happens is when King Henry, both for political and personal gain, wanted to break from the church. So the first the political part was he didn't want to share his power because, as I stated before, the Roman Catholic Church held a lot of power. They were extremely wealthy, and the people all listened to them for the most part, other than the people who were starting to raise these concerns. King Henry the Seventh did not want that. Also, he wanted a divorce from his then wife to be able to marry this other girl that he was interested in. That was strictly forbidden in the Catholic religion. So the Pope denied him that. And so he broke away from the church and started his own church that he called Anglicanism. So, like I said, since then there was a lot more breaks and shifts, but focusing in on those three and the response of the Catholic Church is where we're going next. So, the first one, Lutheranism. In Lutheranism, they kind of went back to the basics, essentially. They believed in the Bible as the main authority. They only found two religious traditions in the Bible, which one was communion and the other baptism. Um, so those are the two rituals that they chose to practice. They believed in following the teachings of the Bible. They kind of somewhat had a humanistic influence in that they believed people should be able to decide how they were going to walk out their life as long as they followed the strict rules laid forth in the Bible. But it was more of an individualistic focus. However, eventually they start to kind of focus less and less on the actual Bible itself, but more so on 
essentially living as a good person, having a strong family life, and following, like, being continuing to be good. But they did believe, though, that man wasn't saved by their works, but by God. And so that was actually also one of the main things of Calvinism. They believed that we aren't saved by works, but by faith alone. However, Calvinism took it a step farther and said that you actually can't decide to be saved, but rather they believed in... Um, Rather, they believed in predestination, which stated that essentially God's the only one that can save us, and he predetermined before we even create it who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. Um, other than that, the rest was pretty similar to Lutheranism in that they only got the two same sacraments in the Bible. They believe the Bible is the ultimate authority, and so forth. Next, we have Anglicanism. Remember, this was the one started by King Henry. Now, this one followed a lot of the same Catholic beliefs. However, it also followed some of the more modern Protestant beliefs, so the beliefs of like Calvinism and Lutheranism and stuff like that. Uh, the main thing it took from those other Protestant beliefs was that um, that we can be saved by faith and that the Bible was the ultimate authority. However, in terms of its following of the Catholic faith, Rather, they, they believed in the divine right of rulers. So like the king and queen being given divine sovereignty. So then you see that there's this movement called Counter-Reformation that takes place. Now this was a movement by the Catholic Church to kind of end some of the corruption within the church and kind of bring people back into the fold slash uh, take back over the areas that had been consumed by Protestantism. Uh, so during this time, there's a lot of war and persecution. Now, remember, persecution is attacking people based on religious beliefs. Um, so a lot of people died. Um, it was not only the Catholic Church attacking the Protestant churches, but also Protestant churches attacking other Protestant churches based on their beliefs as well. Um, eventually, though, there was a peace treaty signed in the 1500s, um, which brought peace to the Protestants and the Catholics. Um However, in the treaty, they essentially divided up territory and said, this territory is going to be Lutheran, this territory is going to be Calvinist, this territory is going to be Catholic, this one's going to be Anglicanism, and so on and so forth. Um, which the division of these different lands led to what's called nationalism, which we'll get into more of later, but essentially it gave people a sense of nationhood or pride in where they're from. Um, this also sparked, was taking place during the Age of Enlightenment, where people were beginning to travel to other places, some to avoid the persecution mentioned earlier. Um, an example of this is you see Protestants going from England to America to escape persecution in England. So that is the Reformation period in a nutshell and its spread.